Hey everybody, Mr. Farmer here. Today we're talking about oligopolies again and the three market models. The takeaway is just those three different models and why they look the way they do. So the first one is going to be the kink demand curve model, collusive pricing model, and price leadership. You can see some notes there. Kink demand curves, you're free to do what you want to do, but you're going to be smart about it. Collusive pricing, best example is going to be something like a cartel. And then price leadership is you follow the leader. So here we go. So first off, why are there these different models? Well, again, oligopolies face different situations. There's the tight oligopoly where there's two or three businesses and they really dominate the entire industry. Or there's the loose oligopoly, six to seven or somewhere around the range, where each one has a high percentage and so they still meet that concentration ratio of 40% or more. But there are definitely some other heavy hitters in there. So it's not all centralized to only about two or three firms. They can have differentiated or standardized products. The firms can act in collusion or not so much depending on the relationship. Or because of game theory, they could look like they're even acting as if they're in collusion. There's sometimes strong and somewhat strong barriers to entry, hence the loose and the tight oligopolies. Essentially, it doesn't fit into one model. So depending on the overlying circumstances, you might see some different aspects happening. Furthermore, and kind of to complicate everything else, firms cannot predict actions of rivals. They can make best guesses. Uh, they can not really estimate their own demand curve because it's interdependent. Depending on what the other firm does, changes the demand for their own. It's going to be hard to try and identify profit also because you can't figure out your own demand curve because it depends on what the other firm is doing also. And so for these kind of general reasons, prices tend to be pretty inflexible. And it's because when you change prices, it gets a little scary. It's a little bit of a mystery there. And so we're going to see that coming through by some of these uh, models that we're going to be going through. When prices do tend to change, they uh, tend to let people know that that's going to be happening. Uh, we'll definitely see this more on the price leadership model, but you definitely see this other places too. So the first one, kink demand curve. This is assumed to be non-collusive oligopoly, so they're not working together, but they're definitely eyeballing each other. So what does it look like? Well, we have match price changes. So we have companies A, B, and C. Uh, and so the demand and margin revenue curves are going to be steeper uh, if they're more inelastic when the prices are lower uh, and they're going to act like a monopoly. Or they can ignore price changes. Uh, and so this is the you're free to do what you want. Do you want to ignore or do you want to match the prices? If they match the prices, the demand curve is going to be more elastic because all the prices are the same. And so the price difference is going to really be the determining factor. Are they standardized products or are they differentiated? Meaning there's a high price and a low price and whatever else price that's going to look at. And if there's choices, it's more elastic. Remember that part. So let's go through a little story. So let's say we have companies A, B, and C. And at first, they start out at this medium price. I'll just kind of make a mark right here. Medium price. But then A, for some reason, decides, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to be up here, and I'm going to price it at the high price. What do you think B and C would do? Remember, they're able to ignore prices. They, they can free will and all that kind of stuff. And so if they price at a high price, are they going to lose consumers? If they stay at the medium price, great. A, thank you for putting yourself out of business. Law of demand says, don't buy this one. So for the me when this happens, B and C are going to be down here. And so because there's now two price options, this is going to be more elastic. Okay, so I'll go ahead and draw demand curve, pretty flat demand curve there. Okay. Now, 
What if instead A says, you know, this time I'm going to price at a low price. Well, if B and C stay up at the medium price like they did before, they're not going to lose business because, again, law of demand says at the lower price, consumers are rational. So what's going to happen is if A goes low away from this medium price, well, the other two are going to follow. So now there's only one price. And because there's only one price, there's only a standardized product. So it's going to be more in elastic. So I'll go and kind of draw a demand curve a little bit more straight up and down. So what we can see is if A decided to price high, we have this more elastic demand curve. And if A decides to price low, we have this more in elastic demand curve. And right here you see the kink. That's what's called a kinked demand curve. Now, if we fill in with the marginal revenue curves, this is what we see. Again, right here is going to be kind of our starting medium point. Up here is the person the A's high price. Okay, let's go and put an H up there. And then down here, this AR2 is going to be the low price point. And so if they go to this top part, we're going to go from this demand curve to this demand curve which means we're going to go from this marginal revenue curve to this marginal revenue curve. If instead we go with this low price point, then now we have to use this lower demand curve, which means we're going to go from here to here, which means we're using the corresponding marginal revenue curve from about here to here. Now we see here is the marginal revenue curves don't exactly link up here. So that's the whole concept of this kink demand curve. And that is a little messy. Let's go ahead and clean this up. This is be our typical drawing. So up here we have the more elastic demand curve. And then down here is going to be the more inelastic demand curve. We don't even draw the extra parts to it though. And then we have the marginal revenue and the marginal revenue curve. Now, where would they produce at? Marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Now where does that happen? Right here. Yes, at this kink portion, at this drop down portion is where they're going to intersect right here. So they'd still be producing at point Q and they go up to, just like before, the demand curve and go to price P. Now this isn't a graph we actually really use to determine output and prices. Uh, and, and But what it does showcase is the price inflexibility. Generally speaking, oligopolies tend to be pretty price stable. And the kink demand curve just helps everybody understand why. No matter what, if you change your demand curve, you're going to be either elastic or inelastic. So let's go back for a second. If I'm in the elastic region, if I increase my price, if I'm elastic, my total revenue decreases. Okay, how about here? If I decrease my price to that low price, I'm inelastic. So my total revenue decreases. So no matter what, my total revenue decreases. So what's the optimum thing for me to do? Stay put. So again, prices tend to be pretty inflexible. Decreasing it is in the inelastic region, decreasing total revenue. Increasing it is going to decrease total revenue. Now there's definitely some criticism. First off, how do we come up with the medium price in the beginning? We don't. We, we, we don't have that. And so again, this model really just tells us that prices tend to be inflexible. And that's really kind of what it's good for, at least for our purposes. Uh, it's not really something a business would actually use to figure any of this stuff out. Okay. But it helps you uh, to identify why businesses stick to their current prices. When the macro economy is unstable, uh, Prices tend to be less uh, rigid, um, and so that's why, again, it can fall apart. Uh, they'll start acting more combative, or they'll start acting more uh, like there's increased competition because their consumer base is a little more inflexible. So again, long-term conversation, this 
tends to even not work out even worse. Also, there can be price wars, um, successive continuous rounds of prices, um, and the just people trying to steal slight shares of markets uh, can also happen with this. So again, it's pretty good. There's definitely some outlying uh, issues with it, though. Okay, how about the second model, the collusive pricing model? Well, if oligopolies have similar products and there's only a few companies that tight oligopoly, then the businesses are more likely to form a cartel, which is where they have a formal or informal agreement with each other on things like pricing, um, output, maybe geographical areas. Now, most cartels are illegal in the United States. Some are legalized, and the ones that are legalized are legalized to protect the consumers is the concept. Just like we allow natural monopolies, why? To protect the consumer. Sometimes it's better off to do that, to let companies go out and make agreements with each other. When they start to look like this and when they start to do cartels, they start to look like a monopoly. And so if we we're going to illustrate a cartel, we would just draw a monopoly graph, which we've covered. I'm not going to go over it, but they'd have a standardized price, a standardized output, a standardized profit. It would act like a monopoly. So what's an example of a legal cartel? Well, one that's been used before is something like the trucking industry. It is safer for the trucking industries to have regulations uh, such as you can only go so many miles in a given day or drive so many hours in a given day. Whereas before, uh, it would be whoever gets their fastest wins the contract. Well, that's not really safe. That's a big semi and some cars are rather small and it had deadly impacts uh, on occasion. And so by letting them act like a cartel, doing standardized pricing, output, even geographical agreements with each other, it made it safer to be on the streets. So yes, they act like a cartel, but it's for the benefit of the consumers. That's just one example of a legal cartel. But again, they print act like a monopoly is how that works. The last one was the price leadership. And it's when there's just one firm that really kind of dominates everybody else. Yes, there's other people there, but really there's one firm and they kind of call the shots here. So instead of acting independently, like we saw in the kink demand curve, you price high, we're going to stay there. You price low, we'll follow. Now everybody just kind of follows them because they have that much sway over the market. All firms are simply going to follow the leader. So there's some leadership tactics that can be used uh, in frequent price changes. So again, pretty similar to the kink demand curve, um, but also we get forewarning of price changes. They don't want to start a price war. They don't want to get themselves into trouble. They're letting the consumers know about price changes up or down along with other businesses. They may even do a thing called limit pricing, which is where they have lower prices than you might expect but it's in order to reduce their overall profit, which sounds odd, but this is to make sure that other firms don't try and enter in. In that way, they'll maintain their oligopoly status, a print creating a barrier to entry or a desire to enter, uh, and therefore continue on as they have been. So hopefully that uh, clarified what we're talking about. Again, the oligopoly is a little complex because it doesn't fit into one simple box. So we have three, the kink demand curve, collusive pricing, price leadership. Now in order to figure out when there's two companies and they're trying to figure out the pricing, we would go back to the game theory and the payoff matrix. This is to understand the overarching concepts for how this works. Until next time.